Council uh, budget hearing for FY 2014 budget. I'm City Council President Bill Dwight. Today we're convening and on the agenda is dispatch, uh, the Northampton Public Schools, Forbes Library, Lilly Library, and the Arts Council. Um, I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilor Adams? Here. Councilor Carney? Present. Councilor Dwight? Here. Councilor Freeman Daniel? Here. Councilor Here. Okay. She's here. She's here. She's here. I saw her. Councilor Schwartz is here somewhere. Um, Councilor Tacey's on his way. I see. Councilor Tacey's on his way. There he is. Sure enough. Everyone's a little bit draggled today for the rain. Thank you all for coming out in the rain. Um, we're going to start with dispatch and actually with an excuse. Um, we have a memo, right? Yeah. Do I have a copy of it? Okay. Kelly Kelly sent us uh, Kelly Wood sent us uh, a memo. Her um, she has a family um, illness that she has to attend to, so she's not able to be here. And she included a memo. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how the council wants to deal with this. I mean, I could read it aloud. It's a long memo. No, uh, place it in the record. Yeah. Okay, there's a call to place this in the public record, the memo from the public safety budget. And there's a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Well, we're not scheduled to hear some of Hampton Public Schools to 515, which is a little awkward. But um, uh, <laughs> I would encourage them to be in. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, except here's the, pro here's the rub. Mm -hmm. It's it is posted for 515, and so as a result, we uh, Mary actually made these all 15 minute meetings. So, but the, uh, since it's posted at 515, I'm afraid we're going to have to go into recess <laughs> until that time. Recess. So, recess. We're going to recess appropriate leading up to the schools. We're going to recess. <laughs> um, Maybe you should read that. <laughs> <laughs> Want me to read the memo now? Yeah. No. No, we're, okay. So we're going to go into recess and uh, reconvene at five. I was building my dam.
Welcome back. We're coming out of recess. This is the City Council uh, budget hearings for FY 2014 budget. My name's Bill White. I'm the City Council President. I'm presiding. Um, just a quick reminder that this, these are budget hearings, the Council budget hearings. There will be no opportunity for public comment tonight. Um, but the public, of course, can, can witness the presentations, of course. That's the whole idea. So next up is the Northampton Public Schools. It's page 121 in your hymnals, and we can proceed. Uh, the superintendent is here and the finance director. Thank you. Brian, step up to the mic. Thank you for uh, coming out. Thank, Thank you, you for, for inviting me to be here. Sharing recess with us. That's <laughs> is very appropriate. Um, what we've done in the past is we've invited um, department heads to uh, do a brief presentation or thumbnail, or they can just open up to questions right out from the right out of the gate. What's I mean, it's up to you. I'll take just a few minutes to do an introduction and explain right. our budget process to you. I know you have the details, so I won't talk through the details, but I'll tell you how we got to where we got. And then I'll be ha very happy to take questions. So as you could see in the budget, we had uh, a level funded budget at first, was our first step. And because of the cost of our increase in services, that led to us needing to look to cut about $1.2 million. And that's you know, the biggest pieces of that are the collective bargaining agreements. Yeah. Uh, salaries and, and steps and so forth and also our school choice uh, money so we use the school choice money we put uh, staff salaries uh, into that category and pay for it out of school choice and that money is actually going down and so we wanted to keep the staff and therefore we had to increase our co our cost increase in that ca in that line item then the mayor was able to uh, work with the unions and uh, look toward the GIC insurance plan, which we were able to restore $450,000 back to the school department budget, which left us looking to cut about $773,000 from the school department budget. Uh, what I want to explain is that in any year, even if we were given all the money we needed for level services, there are still changes to the budget, and I think that's important for people to understand. Um, a system and organization is evolving and growing. And so every year there are things we decide, programs we'd like to strengthen, more support we'd like to give to a certain demographic of kids or at a certain level of schooling. And so um, we would, the, the budget would change from year to year. It's not just let's move everything forward and keep everything the same. Uh, sometimes people ask questions, well, if you had all the money back, would, would everybody's jobs be restored? And the answer is probably not because we would be doing some things differently. An example would be that as our English language learning population increases, we have to, to stay within state compliance and give them support at all levels. And so we need to increase our support, particularly at the high school. That's an area we would need to increase our budget, and we would have to decrease our budget somewhere else. So those changes do occur from year to year, even if there isn't a budget cut to be had. So from that uh, number, the 733,000, we sat down with my administrative leadership team, which we refer to as ALT. Uh, that's the principals and central office administrators. Uh, and we took a look at our programs, not just what could we cut, but what could we change, strengthen, and evolve, just as I'm saying. And our special education programs and our English language learning support are two areas that there were some changes that you'll see in the budget has some increases. <coughs> and so we want to, in some cases where we have two people, let's say at uh, 0.6 and 0.6, doing a, a position for, to help kids with speech and language issues, we would want that to be a 1.0 position. So that it has a result of a 0.2 cut, but you actually have one full-time person instead of two part-time people. So there's some shifts in there that may be difficult for you to understand now. I, I won't address each one of those right now, but if you have questions, I would be happy to. So uh, then once we had that budget submitted and voted, um, it was a balanced budget until just a couple of days ago when we got our bus contract back and we found out that our busing costs will go up roughly $225,000 for next year. Keep in mind that it's a five-year contract and so the overall contract is increased uh, you know, by a million dollars, but it's per year that we focus on paying those costs. So it, you know, why did it come as a surprise is probably a good question that will come my way. And that is, we have a three-tier system. Uh, we're in the morning and in the afternoon. And we were talking about reducing it to a two-tier system. So that's 30% of our busing routes and busing costs we figured would uh, be eliminated. With what we knew would be increase in costs of driver's wages and gasoline, things like that, we knew that it would increase. 
we didn't think it would increase more than the 30 percent so we had a, a figured it in as a balanced budget so then when we got the bids back and found out that it increased much more than that we were quite surprised that we could decrease our busing costs by our, our busing services by one third and still have the cost increase like they did this all being new this morning I met with the alt team and we talked about how would we address that budget gap because we do have to present a balanced budget that's our responsibility and that's what we want to do uh, we're looking at things we're not looking to lay anybody else off uh, what we want to do is examine all of our positions that are currently open and unfilled and look at a way to combine services or reduce services without filling certain positions and we also want to examine the busing services and see if there's a way we can streamline that even more um, all of that being said, school committee will be hearing it from me right now for the first time because we just made these decisions this morning. I haven't had a chance to talk to school committee yet, so we will we put that on the agenda for Thursday night, and we will um, vote a new balanced budget Thursday night. Let me stop there. You want me to talk about? Um, right. The councilors have questions. Uh, uh, Councilor Tacey? Yep. You just said you'd like to not fill some programs completely something you said if you so that's what I just heard from you you know you would look at I don't remember you, you weren't going to reduce any more any more any more positions we're not going to lay off any more people yeah right rather we're going to examine the positions that are open that are unfilled right now we've had certain internal promotions that open up vacancies we also have people who have retired that we haven't replaced them yet so we want to look at a way that we can save money with those open positions by combining them or not rehiring a position uh, without laying someone off. That's our goal. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Council LaBarge, you had a question? Yeah, um, Brian, this was in the Gazette today. Yeah. And one of my residents called and said, did you see the Gazette? I said, no. So I finally looked at it at four o'clock this afternoon and you're talking about this issue. In the Gazette it is stating that you apparently were notified last Thursday of this happening. Right. right, right. Can you explain, because the person that had called me was very concerned because this is at a five-year contract, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, at this 225000 that we are now short of, when was this bid submitted in? Uh, we had the bid opening, was it Thursday or Wednesday? Thursday. Thursday afternoon we did the bid opening I alerted school committee and general public through my blog and but you assumed Friday. you were gonna get that we thought it was bid. going to be closer to even seeing as how we, we reduced our service we didn't think the cost increase would be greater than what we reduced in services and they notify you like that just saying nope this is it 225,000 over then that's our lowest bid the mayor and you want to speak to that I was say, this was a formal bid opening so the, the, the all of the bids that have been submitted were open and read and this was the low bid so um, they went through a formal process There's so then that puts you into a predicament especially when you've already put your budget in place mm -hmm. and now like you were saying you're going to examine all positions okay the open positions that are open right. positions and also you are going to examine on about the busing service okay because I have great concerns about reading this and having our kindergarten and our eighth graders okay, being targeted at about busing and and I find this to be very heartbroken you know that this would affect our kindergarten and eighth graders high school I know we've had a problem with that but this is really bad right. and I'm hoping that you really can look at your budget and solve this problem somehow to get that busing back for our kindergarten and eighth graders well thank you and I agree with you and I appreciate your support for our youngest students because they need a ride to school uh, currently that bid is for uh, all kindergarten through eighth grade students who are 1.5 miles or further away from exactly. school. Exactly. Right. And, and, and that's, that's why so there's an issue. 
No, the law mandates that we give kids a ride to school from kindergarten through sixth grade and two miles, for two miles away from school. Yeah, so we do a little better than what we're mandated to do. Council Schwartz, do you have a question? Just to clarify, this, the K through eight's not on the table. That, is that on the table? That's not even on the table, cutting busing for them, for that population. Did I, did I misunderstand that? Uh, I said we, one of the ways we're going to have to look at addressing this gap is by examining if we can still afford to do K through 8 at 1.5 miles away rather than the state requirement of I 2 see. miles and K through 6. But again, uh, we haven't discussed this as a school committee yet. I will be presenting them with some options because we will have to vote a balanced budget and we'll try to do that Thursday night. Uh, consultation. <coughs> we don't hire, uh, for school choice, we don't hire teachers if we have extra kids choice again. We just utilize the staff that we have. Yes, you're correct. So the teachers and the principals take a look at their class enrollment for next year and let's say they have a class size of 16 and they say we could take 19 they open up three spots in that grade then we bring kids in so yeah we don't have to hire additional people for it that, that was the, the the question that i got from my ward was we're hiring teachers to for school choice so no we don't no right that's so, the real benefit of school choice you right. bring kids in to fill seats without hiring additional staff just had to have you say it thank you that's correct uh other questions do you you want to Sure. The next question may be, you know, what are we doing to prepare for the override and what is coming back? Because that's the question that I get often. Uh, so what we're looking at with the override is approximately a million dollars for the schools. And within that budget, we're trying to build a, a reserve account so that we can not have to face these cuts from year to year. And uh, also we want to bring back some of the, and restore some of the positions that are being cut uh, from the budget. So, uh, you know, without, you know, releasing any specifics, because now everything, once again, is up in the air as we make further cuts uh, on Thursday. Uh, we really want to focus on classroom teachers, programs, and services coming back directly to our kids. That would be um, our number one priority with the override money if we're uh, fortunate enough to have that pass. Questions from the counselors? Um, uh, did Councilor Schwartz? Um, so just to clarify, when you're saying, you know, you're not going to be laying off any new positions if uh, with this, but you would, um, you'd be consolidating, was that the term, or, or not filling, that still the consequence is still there, it, therefore, is that there are fewer professionals in the school. Yes. So, the, so there's just a real. I just want to tr make sure that we're translating the reality on the ground. What we don't want to do, especially after an April of sitting down with people and letting them know they're losing their jobs or part of their job, uh, we certainly don't want to do that to people again. And I don't believe that we have to do that right. at this point. Um, we do have some open positions that are very important and necessary positions. Uh, but if we have to reduce services regardless to make our budget balanced, we want to do that in a way without taking away our jobs from our current employees. And where does the reserve fund fit in your equation around this analysis, vis-a-vis -vis this, these additional, this surprise additional cost? Well, right now we <coughs> have a reserve fund. We've built a budget the last two years without a reserve fund. Um, and so what we would hope if, um, and again, if we're fortunate enough to have the override pass, that we would build a reserve into the school department budget so that we have some flexibility next year and we wouldn't have to do these same things. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels and Councilor Carney. Uh, thank you, Councilor, for coming in. And um, I'm not sure if this might be the first time we've ever had budget hearings from the. It's been school. it's been a while, if, if not. Yeah, it's, it's fairly really impressive. In, in the in the recent or in the foreseeable past, um, I have a couple questions. One, sure. it, isn't it it's, isn't it common? I'm not sure if I'm gathering everything that you're saying. Isn't it common practice to lay off a, a large number of teachers in this in the spring, uh, and then to hire some back in the fall? It was. It was before I came here. I think that's a terrible practice and it's inefficient. Uh, it's not good for morale and it's not good for, <coughs> well, certainly not good for our bottom line. If you do that, um, you end up paying unemployment to people and then hiring them back, and so it actually costs you more to do that. 
it's better to examine your staff and then lay off only those who you don't think you'll be bringing back. And so that you did that this year? That's what we did so last year and this year. Right. Those are not the positions we're talking about that will be filled by, by this, not necessarily. Perfect. Not necessarily, right. But not it, necessarily. It is possible. It is possible. Okay, so some of the, some of the yeah. positions that you lay the people off for whatever reason, you may not even fill them. With, any, with anyone, either better well, let me let me be. A, I, you know, I hesitate to give any specifics, as I've said, because I want to talk to school committee. But I will make a proposal to school committee, and they, of course, of course, vote uh, the budget. Uh, but my proposal will not be classroom teacher positions that we're not going to fill. My proposal will have to do with administrative positions, and uh, possibly uh, custodial positions. But I'm not recommending classroom teachers at this point. Um, and um, I'm not. I, I'm not in charge. I'm not an elected official for the school. Uh, I'm not. I don't sit on the school committee. Mm -hmm. But I, I would uh, counsel a hard look at um, at uh, expanding the uh, the distance that, that the students walk to school mm -hmm. to the state mm -hmm. minimum, um, due to the fact that Northampton really is a very walkable city mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, that it, it sadly it's it's what the state requires and it's some way it's a way to save money. Thank you. Council Carter. <coughs> Thank you, uh, you, Superintendent. Just a quick question about Jackson Street. I'm just not I, I don't know that I understand the um, all of the acronyms. So the two eliminations of the F T E C O T A is that uh, what is that? Uh, certified occupational therapist okay. assistant. Okay, mm -hmm. and the and the <coughs> TL. That's an educational team leader, special education position. Yep. So we eliminated the ETLs at the high school and the middle school last year, mm -hmm. and so unfortunately, it's the elementary school this year. Um, <clears throat> you eliminated so there. Uh, I, I guess I just don't understand that. Uh, that's the one to ones, right? Um, the ETL. Yeah. No, that's a person who uh, is sort of a, a leader with the special education teachers and reviews IEPs oh, okay. and leads the oh, IEP yes, team meetings. That's right. Okay. So that work still exists and that falls okay. on the shoulders of the special education teachers now. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Consultation. <coughs> so, so that's really a, that's a consolidation of <coughs> of their charge. Right. And I guess the acronym was just kind of throw me. Hey, thank you. Um, you know, the, the, the public discussion has been focusing around the cuts and the arts and, and, and programming. And, and the philosophy, I understand that you're, you're, there's the concept of abiding by core requirements or essentially STEM programs. And these are established a little beyond your pay grade, I assume, but that that uh, the frustration I think that we're hearing expressed is people um, are concerned about the loss of programs that actually teach or actually promote and establish critical thinking. Um, a lot of the STEM programs are not necessarily focused on critical thought, although I know that you have Ernie Brill behind you who is a person who's devoted to critical thinking. and But the fact is that, that Arts program definitely develops creative thought and and critical thinking and um, and I realize that that's not necessarily MCAS material. Is are you pressured by those priorities that have been established statewide and even national nationwide <coughs> to creating uh, to moving away from those things and to focus more on the the STEM programs? Well, um, the easy answer is yes, but not necessarily uh, the, the complete answer. Um, I feel the pressure of our teachers and our administrative team who feel very strongly that the arts is a valuable component of a child's education. I believe that also reflects the community values. So I would say that I feel uh, more of a responsibility to the community of Northampton to make sure that we preserve as much as we can the music, arts, and PE and wellness classes for our kids. Um, unfortunately, I have to follow the, the laws of the Department of Education, and we're required to provide X number of hours of um, instruction in the core academic requirements. So um, we're 
you know, we're going to meet that requirement, but we're working very hard to keep all of the considered extras, which we know are part of the core learning of a child, uh, in our budget. Well, thank you. I actually wanted at least the walls that you were pressed up against to be defined for the public to understand that, um, again, we're, most of the things that we're talking about and the struggles that you're trying to reconcile is unfunded mandates and uh, state pedagogy that doesn't necessarily reflect the sentiments of this community and create certain problems. I would also add on the, on the busing distance, the thing is, is that's a circle on a map. It doesn't necessarily reflect road systems. It doesn't safe, uh, doesn't reflect sidewalks. It doesn't reflect hills. It doesn't reflect all the other things that mm -hmm. hazards. It's just a draw a compass around the school, and and that's the state mandate. So it's, and I understand, and I know a lot of parents would be very upset with the prospect of you have <coughs> two parents working at home. Who don't have the who don't have the means or the ability to get their children to school, and you and also another pressure point here is within the community is a lot of uh, our people on in subsidized housing live some distance from the schools. Um, it's not we're, we're not like a lot of cities where it's in the urban core. So it, 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 once again, it's a state so, yeah. mandate that doesn't necessarily have any practical application that has it has all those nuanced problems that present themselves to you as you guys <coughs> figure this out. I remember when we expanded to 1.5 mm -hmm. and that was that was met with a great deal of concern expressed concern in the public so um, I'm, oh, I'm sorry I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut no, you. No, 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 I was respond to you that I think I'm glad you appreciate the complexities of school busing. It's not as simple as it may sound. And there are dangerous roadways without sidewalks. Um, there are great distances to get to school. And we can't just simply cut the busing and then do a simple formula that that's the money we're going to save. We have to also calculate in lost revenues. People pay for bus passes. And we also have to calculate and possibly increase costs in crossing guards uh, because more kids will be walking to school. So it's not as simple as cut the bus and save exactly this much. <coughs> it's, it's an equation. Councilor Freeman Daniels. Thank you. Uh, one and a half is as arbitrary as two. Don't, I, I'm not saying one's better than the other, it was one's closer, that's all. Can you, <laughs> it's, can you give us the, the broad strokes for the cuts here? I mean, we, we hear about, uh, so first of all, we hear that uh, we're going to lose art music in the high school or something like that. I want you to actually, could you give us a more specific, more critical examination? And also, um, I think there is, I think there is some, some misunderstanding about the state of our elementary schools. Um, it, so far, so far as I know, it really is the case that there are it, the the school supplies budget is zero. But if that's not true, could, I mean, could you just openly say that that, that that pencils and paper and books and so on, there's no budget for that. There's no budget or very little budget. Um, what what we do use is that, and I hesitate to say this publicly, but I will because it's true. Teachers buy a lot of supplies out of their own pocket. And it's a reality, and we know that it happens. It's very unfortunate, and the PTOs know that and respect it. And many of the PTOs try and reimburse teachers up to a certain amount. Um, some schools went to $150 per teacher to buy supplies. It doesn't come close to covering the costs of what teachers pay for out of their own pockets. Uh, so yeah, teachers need materials to teach their classes. And what about books? What about the book, the especially nonfiction books in the in the elementary schools? Yeah, we don't uh, we don't make large textbook purchases any longer. Uh, we do make some workbook purchases, um, but yeah, the the textbook budgets have been have gone the way of the school supply budgets. So could you could you estimate the average age of a textbook that the that elementary school students are using? Uh, no, I couldn't. I mean, are we, is, is it have they been purchased over the last ten years, years old? Years? Oh, no, oh, really? over ten years old. So. Yeah. Yeah, particularly a problem at the high school when you have science books that are over 10 years old. It's, it's very difficult. Um, but they do, yeah. teachers are resourceful, That's your and there are a lot of things available on the internet that they can get materials, and you know, scientific community has been very active uh, globally using the internet to share research and share studies. So 
teachers have been resourceful in getting up-to-date materials. I don't want people to get the impression that our kids are having this aging education. Um, the teachers have been finding a way, creative ways, to get up-to-date information to the kids. But the teachers aren't doing it. It's really not in the budget. Right. Right. And then, how many? I mean, how many computers do the students have access to on a, you know, on a regular basis in their classrooms? Our technology is getting better. This past year has been a lot better, and we have plans in place for next year to be even better. So, um, when I came to the district two years ago, there was quite a. <coughs> Of knowledge of, of instructional technology and available equipment, but we've addressed that. It's been a number one priority for my two years here, and we've made great gains in that area. We still have ways to go, but uh, it's, it's not nearly where we were two years ago. Comment on the music and art. And yeah, I wanted to go back to that. So, the music and art, I would, I would like to address that. I think that's important. We worked very hard, our administrative team, on making these cuts so that we could have a responsible budget and also provide the best education we can for our kids. So when we sat down, you see, for example, the high school list and the middle school list. You don't see, uh, you don't see many full positions that were cut. We would take uh, you know, a teacher who teaches six sections, three sections <coughs> per semester, and cut a section, cut half of a position, a third of a position, so that we would reduce what we were offering without trying to cut it. Um, that's important. So we're still offering band choir art, still offering it, but it's at a reduced class load. What that means to the person who's teaching, they're going from a full-time job to a part-time job. That's a big impact on their family income. And you know, we hope that we'll be able to retain the staff. And what that <coughs> means to a student who's signing up, we can say, yes, there's still this art class, but you're not going to be able to take it till you're a senior, because instead of having four sections, we only have one. And therefore, you take 25 kids per year. The seniors sign up first. They're going to get the class. So what it feels like to the family whose child comes home and wanted to take art and music <coughs> and uh, you know photography and all these classes comes home and says, my guidance counselor told me I can't get into any of those classes. For that family, it's as good as cutting those classes because they have to wait two or three years to get there. <coughs> um, you would follow? Yeah, sure. I realize, I realize that you're not in an easy position uh, to enumerate the um, situation at the schools because a parent who's watching this might decide that they want to pull their student in so it's not an easy conversation to have I appreciate your uh, your tact but we really do have to get to some of the specifics here and, and mm -hmm. I thank you for for uh, going into that um, the the um, so the the basic summary is that you're cutting a lot of programming uh, but they are not it's not going to be gone it's just going to be available only to a few right we tried not to cut subjects but we did cut opportunity and availability to that subject right so it, it's it's only available to a few students at a limited at a limited time right thank you council murphy and then council schwartz Re relative to technology to recall that there's a hundred thousand dollars <coughs> in the capital plan which is outside of this budget for the public schools technology program <coughs> And we have kind of been consistently funding that outside of their regular budget, so it's earmarked for technology things. So that helps them out a little bit. <coughs> we appreciate that greatly. Excuse me. It's made a big difference for our kids. Is that right? Yeah, it's a, it's a, a five-year plan, so right. it's been going along to, to give them that money for that specific purpose so they don't feel like they have to cannibalize it for something else. Right. It's been wonderful. <coughs> So just to confirm my comprehension, the, the cuts that Councillor Freeman Daniels elicited from you, um, if the override passes, that's, those cuts are fundamentally restored. I mean, I know there's things around the edges, but do I understand that correctly? Not all of them, but most of them. And because that's our priority of what we want to bring back. And if the override passes, what happens to the school supply budget? We increase that greatly. Uh, that's part of our our latest thinking on what we would do with the override money that we as much of a priority as it is to bring the arts and music back to the kids we also want to bring the supplies back to the teachers and so we've uh, it'll appear very generous to the teachers who've had nothing um, but I think it's it's a very fair and responsible proposal uh, Councilor Tayson and Council Labarge can you uh, get in a little bit to the foreign language 
at the school the five years of foreign language. That I, I, I've had the question asked to me a lot of times. Is it necessary to have five years of a foreign language stuff that is taught in the universities and colleges at the high school level? Seems to me that's a higher education uh, charge. Is that correct? Well, actually, it's two years that most colleges require uh, for students to have. Yeah. Um, what our students like to do is take four years. And if you take four years and you're fairly proficient in language, when you go to college, you can take a test and maybe get some credits under your belt already if you've had good instruction going into college. So it's quite a financial benefit to families when you get credits. Uh, same with the AP courses. Uh, but it's also a great learning advantage for the kids because then they go to college and they can start uh, Spanish year two or Spanish year three if they're proficient enough. I understand that. But, but there are courses that are afforded at the, col at the college level. Yes. That we will cut certain things out of our high school budget or our elementary school budget in order to provide a college level course at the high school. Yeah, I would say that you know, the fourth year of language, certainly you could call that a college level course right along with all the AP courses. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Councilor Freeman Dams. It's true also that colleges teach trigonometry and calculus as well. Algebra, and introductory math. And they also teach U.S. history. Right. And so um, just because colleges teach it doesn't mean that it is a course that, that can only be taken in, in college or is necessarily a higher level course. I don't think we'd find any support in our schools or among our families for cutting our most challenging courses. I think that's really our flagship. That's what Northampton students, teachers, the superintendent but is very proud of. Just to yeah. just to keep going, uh, it, it's also the case, and you, I mean, you you know, you're going to a school that's not located in this country. That other countries uh, do language arts at a much earlier age than the city of Northampton. Yes, it's language education starts in kindergarten. So, and and it doesn't start in in Northampton at that age. No, not. So, would you say that? Uh, the two years of language arts in, in the, at the high school level spread out over four years would be sufficient to, for a high school graduate to be able to speak the language well with, with, it, no. with other languages. Two years, years of, of world language. language, you would not speak the language. Sorry. Thank you. You'd learn the basic vocabulary and the structure of the grammar, but you wouldn't be speaking the language after two years. It's, all, it's also the fact a, a person's ability to retain and understand a new language diminishes as they age and one of the things it's it is more appropriate to get them younger learning the language an alternate language uh, rather than later by the time you get I mean some of my age trying to learn another language is a, practically a dead loss I think but uh, <laughs> I disagree I think learning is good at any age but you are correct that it's it's easier because uh, language ability is more flexible at younger ages and all the research shows that the younger you start learning languages the better it is and if you start learning your second language at the right age you know four or five or six years old then your third fourth and fifth language come much easier later on and it's and and learning other languages is actually fundamentally applied towards critical thinking the the Jeffersonian yeah. ideal for education and edu educated citizens Council Labarge, you had a question? Um, he answered part of it about the language. On the um, reserve funds, which you don't have, but I can recall we have heard of this problem for a long time where the teachers had to go ahead and they would go out and use their own money and buy supplies, pencils, or whatever. I know I've talked with many teachers throughout the years on my ward who have done this so what I'm asking is with the override coming for a vote you are saying that these supplies will come back that's one of our priorities teachers how much I can't tell you that right but it is what I you know as I said the teachers will find it very generous and we feel that it's a responsible amount still having a problem about the bid on the busing that they notified you last Thursday and you already put a budget in front of us and then being told 
that we are shortcutted here, $225,000. It's like, where's the time here? Why was that bid opened up last Thursday or ended last Thursday? With the, the budgeting, some of it is your best estimate. And the transportation cost that we built into our budget was our best estimate. Again, proposing to reduce the service by 30%. We expected that the financial so that's a red flag so next time because it's like every five years that you go through this contract right. and why are we doing illinois on that I don't is that the that only they bid. bid i think that they uh they asked for the bid materials but i don't think they submitted that's, that's right. a parent company location oh so that was the only bid we had two bids two bids yeah. okay thank you I have uh, the mayor. You want to you want to comment? No, okay. I uh, and th th this is more. And this actually would have not much much to do with you, but I, I I'm wondering if the um, city uh, the town of Brookline, I believe it's a town, uh, experimented with uh, uh, transitioning to tablets, assigning tablets to all to this uh, iPad, um, and which the upfront costs obviously were substantial but the, the subsequent costs are diminished because the, the open source software that's available the also the you, well you're not making kids do a forced march with 180 pounds worth of books in their bags and they're updated books and texts and they aren't necessarily limited to the Texas standards has that idea ever been tossed around uh, in the school committee uh, it has not to my knowledge, been tossed around the school committee, you will find no support in tech professionals on that, and including myself. Uh, I, I love my iPad. I think it's a lot of fun. It's not that useful for educational activity. Uh, I think laptops are far more useful than iPads, and also iPads will not be able to handle the new park testing. So the districts that did dive in for the one-to-one -one iPad model also have to buy desktops and laptops for the park testing. Um, so it's a nice creative tool to have, but it doesn't replace real computers. Uh, just, just along those same lines, I know it's at least probably five years ago, the state of Maine, uh, I think it's a federal grant they received to supply every student in the state of Maine with a laptop. Um, mm -hmm. There was a MacBook. Is it, and yeah. is there, there is there, there, I would imagine, a manifested uh, digital divide in, in our schools, with students who have access to broadband uh, and computers? At home? Yeah. You're saying? Yeah. Uh, I think that it's, it's pretty level. Um, our kids today have access at school with computers uh, now. You know, I'm saying that wasn't exactly true two years ago, but we've come a long way. And our, our kids are getting the technology education in school. So yes, some kids have the advantages to have it at home where they can practice and explore and uh, do, you know, learn new ways to navigate the internet and things like that. Uh, but I would say all kids have access to the technology skills that we want them to have. And Councilor Barge. Yes, um, I think I heard you say that there would be an increase in um, crossing guards. That doesn't come out of your budget. I thought that came out of the police department's budget. Yeah, but we're all one city. And so no, but it comes out of the police department's budget, correct? Well, we're all part of one city budget. I understand that, yeah. but I'm asking you, doesn't it come out of the police department's budget? Because when I talked with Chief Sinkowitz and Captain Conkis of getting that cross guard back at Ryan Road School, he said that it came out of his budget and he really would like to see it go into your budget. <laughs> <laughs> I believe all of that is true. Uh, however, if, let's say we need to increase uh, six crossing guards and the police uh, budget doesn't have it in it, it wouldn't be right for them to cut police officer to add crossing guards. It would be a, a shared pain between the school and the police because we have a shared interest in having it happen. Yeah, I, I appreciate this and you coming here too. This is, it's all about the money and everything in here is about the money. And I, what I, my question would be is you reduce uh, like 0.83 or 0.34 of, of an FTE that does not disenfranchise the existing student, does it? The, the, the amount of students that you have right now, is there a reason why it is that exact number? Is there uh, 
is there not that many students in that program at this particular point to warrant the full time? I mean, I, I know it's right. I, I see what it's a balancing act. I, I see the whole thing. Right. I, I see the big picture here. So I understand that, your question. So, are we? Would those sections be full if we were offering the full time position versus the point three four? And in some cases, yes, those sections would be full. Okay. Yeah. So those kids have to take elective elsewhere. Thank you. Any other questions? Ryan, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate thank you. It. Thank you for having me here. We, very good we, uh, questions. Yeah, thanks. We, uh, your new job. <laughs> we respect the struggle that you're dealing with. So thank you. Thanks for your time. Um, <laughs> okay. Actually, so fourth now. We're behind, so we don't need to go into many more recesses. Uh, next up is Forbes Library. Seventy-one. Um, Handouts. Oh, reading hey, pictures. Pictures. <laughs> wow. My apologies. I have to go. Jay, take a hand. Color pictures, or is that not in the budget? Color pictures. Mm. So I'm Janet Molding. I'm the director of Forbes Library, and thank you for inviting me here. I'm always happy to come and talk about Forbes. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Forbes, and I'll just take a few minutes to talk about things we do. Because even though I know you're familiar with Forbes and you're probably fond of Forbes, I bet you haven't a clue how much actually goes on at Forbes or how much we actually offer. Um, you all know that we're a big, busy, circulating library. Um, an average of a, nearly 1,000 people a day come into Forbes. 62% um, of Northampton <laughs> residents have active Forbes library cards. We circulate over 400,000 books, CDs, videos, thanks to Pleasant Street Video, um, audiobooks, ebooks, museum passes, musical instruments. Are, um, every single year, that averages out to 180 items an hour. And that also means 180 items an hour have to get put back on the shelves when they're returned. Um, like, like many public libraries, um, Forbes is a community <coughs> space where people spend time um, to meet with others or spend time alone doing their own projects. But unlike many public libraries, in Northampton is very fortunate that the building itself is a magnificent, awe-inspiring community space. And it's a very popular space. Um, 47,000 people used our public internet computer terminals last year. And many, many, many more use the library's free wireless with their own devices. Um, our programs, which age from, or range from tummy time to things for senior citizens, had 20,000 people attend last year. We have two meeting rooms. They were used 525 times by community groups last year. And. Um, and some people just come in without a library card, read newspapers, read magazines, play with jigsaw puzzles, um, or meet with our tutors or a counselor in our small study room. But Forbes is even more than just a public library. It's more like an academic library or a museum or an art gallery. Our reference staff answered 56,000 reference questions last year. 4,000 people visited the Coolidge Museum and the Hampshire Room for Local History, and 100 local artists displayed in the Hosmer Gallery at Forbes Library. And now that the Community for the Arts is losing their space, Forbes will be the only nonprofit community art space in town, which arts, a town that prides itself on arts, I think is rather sad. So this is just a glimpse of how busy Forbes is and how much we do. But our budget keeps getting squeezed and our hours keep getting reduced, but we just keep getting busier. We were more than 20% busier last year than we were the previous year, and that's been a pattern ever since the economic downturn that we've just increased the usage more and more every year. When we do customer satisfaction surveys, we ask people what they want most. And overwhelmingly, 
just way overwhelmingly what they want is that the library be open more hours instead of fewer. So that's the thing that we can't give them. We try to give them so much, but the thing they want the most is the thing we can't give. Thank you. Um, so. Councilor Casey. Oh. Uh, you never have to defend uh, Forbes Library to me. I think it's a great place. And uh, I just flipped through your handout here. And it, Forbes Library is a vital, active community center for all of Northampton, responsive to the community's needs and dedicated to serving the public. Absolutely. It's in, in a nutshell right there. And um, I think it's a great place. And uh, it's always been an asset. I, and the building is absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Well, and, uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. So then I was going to talk a little sure, bit about please. the budget, the actual budget, why we're here. Um, I guess the mayor told you that um, the libraries have to be certified by the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. And that's a rather complex process with lots of different parts, um, including the hours we're open, the amount we spend on materials that's for the public, whether we participate in interlibrary loan, and Owen, that we don't charge for services. <laughs> so. And um, the part that's pertinent here is that they require that the municipal appropriation increase every year according to a formula they have. So this year, for FY15, the library appropriation is $1,114,225, which is 1.3% um, of the city's budget, but it's $17,000 more than it was last year. And although we appreciate $17,000 more than we got last year, that is not enough to cover the increases in operating expenses and give raises to our staff. Our staff has a bargaining unit. They have a contract which stipulates what kind of raises they're supposed to receive. They have not received those raises since FY08. Um, we belong to a consortium, which is, charges us almost $43,000 a year. We're, we have to be part of that. That increases every year. And of course, all the service contracts, um, electricity, gas, insurance, things like that, we have no control over. Uh, oh, what I didn't say is what we get from certification, among many other things, is that without being certified, we could not participate in interlibrary loan, which has become crucial to library patrons. That's the most important thing. The second most important thing is if we were not certified, we could not receive state aid. So the, the city is increasing our appropriation by $17,000 in FY14. In return for that, we will receive almost $39,000 in state aid. So that, for once, is a mandate that pays back. Um, but as I said, the $17,000 isn't sufficient. And um, the budget has been squeezed every year for years now. And as a result, the libraries had to close Saturdays in the summer. We will be doing that again starting the Saturday after July 4th. We've had to reduce the hours in the Coolidge Museum to um, four half days a week. The Hampshire Room for Local History is only open one and a half days a week. Um, our outreach program, which is our delivery service to nursing homes and homebound people, has gone from two full-time equivalents to one part-time employee, which means delivery is now once every three weeks instead of every week. Um, and as I said, we haven't been able to give our staff raises. We are still bargaining, working with our bargaining unit, whether they're going to take the raises this year or not. If they do, it means we will have to cut one part-time employee. So that's the budget picture at Forbes. Thank you. Uh, any questions, uh, Council Lamar? Yes, it might be off track, but I'm not sure. But I know, um, Janet, that there's a fundraiser going out there which I talked with Judith Ryan about a couple of weeks ago and her husband. And she said at that point that they had raised like over a hundred and something thousand dollars. Yes. Okay. When do you think that that handicapped elevator, when do you think 
that that elevator will be put in place? Well, we hope to finish the fundraising by the end of this calendar year. And then we think uh, we have to go out to bid and you know receive the bids and open the bids, and then the contractor has to order parts and do site preparation. So we're hoping that would only take s about six months. Because total. that's been a, a big problem, especially on the Committee on Disabilities, that they have no access to that, and there's okay. been complaints about the parts taking so long. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's heartbreaking for us at the library to see people at the bottom of those granite steps. You can't get into the library. Mm -hmm. Carry things out to them, but as I've shown you, there's so much more than just books and videos at Forum. So, thank you for the update, Councilor Tacey. In the building envelope is secure at this point. Is that correct? Yes, except for the windows. Except the windows for the still windows. need to be worked on. Okay. But it, but basically, yes, the walls okay. and the roof are in good shape. And and inside has been handled also. Yeah. And so you don't have it. What do you have for capital improvements on the? In, down the pipe here, do you have in, in the five besides five. besides the elevator? Um, that's it. I've also requested money for the um, for the windows, and we've requested funds for a separate HVAC system for the special collections rooms, so we don't have to run the entire building HVAC to preserve the special collections. C Council Murphy can update. Yeah, I just, that's, I, that's what I was just going to ask. Yeah, capital plan one hundred thousand for handicapped elevator for this next year. And I believe um, the Windows issue went back to CPC, didn't it? Right. For and funding because of, of the historic nature of the building. Right. And they wanted a more detailed description of the problems of every window. And they also wanted to know why the Capital Improvement Committee wasn't putting up. If it was so important, why it wasn't being funded. So we're sort of between them. But we'll, we'll keep pushing away at that. Thank you for coming today. And um, a couple of things. Uh, I received the uh, request for um, for donations, public donations to the uh, handicap accessible. So just for the viewing public, if you could let them know if there are people who are really interested in donating to that worthy cause, how might they access that? Is there a link on the website? Yes, uh, ForbesLibrary.org has a link you can pay online. Okay. Or Bring it into the library or send it to the library. Thank Come you. pick it up. Uh, as you pointed out, it is, uh, I would imagine, pretty heartbreaking to see folks who can't access uh, the stairs to get into the building. And then I just wanted to, again, plug um, the great work you do in the, um, the local history, especially. Uh, you, uh, you know, it really helped me a lot 20 years ago, um, just the incredible wealth of information there. I had a big project for... Um, unbelievable. You could go into that room and spend... Weeks, yeah. weeks, and never see everything that's and there. And the amazing things. It's bottomless, and and for, you know when there is not a lot of other uh, data around there for, for local histories, especially oral history, even the, at least there's one place to go where yeah. there's a, a wealth of information. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, Ms. Ms. Director Moling, will you take me through this, the. Uh, O and M portion of the budget, especially this ESCO debt service. That what is that? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, the, you, you're familiar ESCO, with ESCO, right? Yeah, but I thought that that was supposed to be net. It was supposed to be a net, uh, either zero or uh, positive for the city. I don't understand why we're having, where we're paying debt service on this. Would you like to explain that, Susan? <laughs> I recognize the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the debt service, the way the ESCO is structured is that the debt service would be paid for with the savings uh, generated um, by the energy improvements. And so there's been, uh, that's actually something we've, we've been having a, a lot of discussion <laughs> with the uh, director molding and the trustees about. Um, and actually Chris Mason has gone before the trustees to talk about those savings. So the idea was that some of the savings. Oh, go to the mic, please. Oh, sorry, that some of the savings uh, generated would help pay the debt service. That's how the ESCO is structured. Um, so the savings themselves would pay for the debt the debt service on all the improvements. So, oh, okay. So, so this is just a. So we would see if we went back to other budgets, we'd see more cost regarding. Uh, where's the, well, where's the electricity? Well, for example, uh, um, they no longer have an oil. Uh, 
heat there in the building. That's been retrofitted now to gas, and the oil tanks have been pulled. So you certainly won't see any more oil bills uh, for the library. Um, so that was one of the retrofits that happened, as well as controllers and other things like that. So, um, but that is one of the issues we've been talking about uh, in terms of um, trying to work with them on covering those that debt service cost, as well, and trying to explain what the savings, how the savings are calculated. So this is, is this because of the private, or the semi-private nature of Forbes Library that the, the the debt service elements are into their budget instead of well, the city's? What we did is we tried to um, we tried to allocate it to NPS, to Smith Vogue, to um, uh, and to all the various uh, departments. Like for example, if we did improvements at the water treatment plan or the or the uh, things like that, they were allocated to those budget areas. Um, you know, I will say this is a system we inherited and we've had to try to, uh, it's, it had, it's had, we've had some bumps and we've tried to sort through it. Um, but that's sort of the basic idea, that the debt, the allocation of the debt service is done in proportion to the project, how the projects were done throughout the city. So we would, we would hope that Forbes is experiencing Fifteen thousand dollars, roughly fourteen thousand nine hundred dollars of savings from it that converted to natural gas. And that's where there's been a lot of discussion about that. Um, we believe that those savings are there, and uh, we've and Mr. Mason's gone before the trustees to talk to to, uh, to try to spell that out for them. Um, uh, but obviously, we all have budgetary pressures, and uh, so that that it it it's part of that whole discussion that we're having. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the only thing I would add to is I, I appreciate what the director said about um, the fact that uh, you know we are required to increase our budget, our allocation by 1.5 percent to maintain our funding. I would though ask you to look at page 10 of your budget, which is uh, the cherry sheet historically for library aid, and you can see that that number has gone down every year since. So uh, you know, the amount the state's giving us in aid down for libraries yet they require us to increase every year so it's it's just part of the overall thing that I've been talking about about how the decrease in state aid over the last several years is one of our largest issues because it puts more pressure on our budgets and so we'd obviously love to be able to provide more funding uh, above and beyond that but that's <coughs> one of the pressures we're facing. So. Councilor Premier Damon you still have the floor and then Councilor Tacey. Director Molding um, you talk about the uh, increase in um, usage, and uh, obviously, as libraries continue, as libraries get older, they accumulate more media. Um, I, I mean, I suppose they do purges as well, but mostly you accumulate. Uh, we try to. That's part of being a resource. We try to right? balance so, that out. So. So the shelves hold what we have. Well, I mean, you just you just took on hundreds and hundreds of. Visual, audiovisual media thousands yes and we we actually purged or deaccessioned <laughs> enough sh enough That's materials good. to make shelf space for them but we also the videos are so popular both in Northampton and through interlibrary loan that we actually have three times more videos than we have shelf space if they oh, were all in the library at once they wouldn't fit on the shelf they're just flying around out there uh, yes. well I mean you've seen this increase in usage uh, s a small increase in funding and an increase in demand what I mean h how do you expect to to handle that uh, the increase in demand and usage well the the stress on the staff has increased certainly as they're expected to do more with more with less but we've also cut everywhere we could think of to cut. Like we used to stamp the dates on the books when you were supposed to bring them back. We don't do that anymore because the stamp pads cost money, the little stampers cost money, but most of all the staff time just stamping, opening every book and stamping it costs 180 items an hour. Took a lot of staff time. So that's, it's things like that that we've gotten rid of. And you'll yeah. continue. Yeah, we're always looking for ways to streamline and economize. Now, when a patron comes into the library and looks up something on the computer catalog 
and then goes into the mezzanine or to the second floor to to get the book or a piece of media. Do you consider that charging the patron? No. Okay, thank you. We consider that browsing. <coughs> Concentration. Yeah, I was just going to say what the mayor had alluded to. It is just another unfunded mandate. The state seems to drop what they're providing and asking the city to provide even more. So I think we've had that conversation already a hundred times. Um, you said you rented out the, uh, you don't rent it out. The, you, the public used the community rooms yes. 525 times yes. this year. Do you collect a fee for that? No. We charge businesses who want to use it or people who want to use it after hours. Okay. But if they're a nonprofit or a local community group or you know, um, lo just local people, they use it for free. And you schedule all this. They don't just come in and. Right. Which also that. takes a lot of staff time. Yeah. It's all that schedule. Imagine. Setting up for them, you know, whether they want tables or chairs, how many podium, do they want to use the audiovisual equipment? All of that has to be set up. Okay. Um, thank you. Councilor Barton. Yes. Um, Janet, are there any employees? that are looking at possibly retiring? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I mean, we there are some of us who are certainly getting close to that and are thinking about it, but no, I haven't heard anything definite yet. I want to thank you That's an library and all of your employees for working tirelessly at that library. It's been there forever, as long <laughs> as I was born and raised in this city. And it's just something that is of such importance to everybody here in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Daniels. Yeah, just going back to the Owen budget, uh, part of the budget again, uh, you know, I wasn't paying as close. This is just a question from ignorance, really. Why has it gone in the last few years? Why has it gone from roughly 40,000 to 150, 160? Is that, that just, has it just been an accounting issue? Wait, I'm sorry, what part of the budget are you The doing? O &M portion. Forty thousand. Just in in FY two thousand nine, ten, eleven, and twelve, uh, mm -hmm. operations and maintenance budget was roughly forty thousand dollars, and now it's at. I'm just imagining this. And okay. I'm just. It's a question for me. It's actually a format issue. Yeah, we started I was going to say. Counting the Wikibon yeah. Wikibon yeah. Sorry, it's, it's a. Oh, so yeah, if you yeah. Can speak at the podium. Yeah, you can. Just, if you look at the historical, we started counting the, uh, showing the book. Fund as a, as a outside revenue source toward O and M that you oh. like when you collect money from the parking meters yes. toward the mm -hmm. book fund. So we were showing that, um, like we do with many departments, like uh, we show it as part of the overall revenue, even though we call it out as as a separate revenue source. So it's it's just it's just basically accounting. Yeah. It, it hasn't it hasn't increased by a vast amount. Yeah. If anything, it's almost been flat because we've been just tightening the screws so much. So moving costs away year. as much as possible. Starting with last year's budget, we started doing that. So that's why you see, um, mm -hmm. I think that's probably why you're seeing the change. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Jenny, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Lily Library. Hi, I'm Mary Ann Torche, and I'm the director at Lilly Library, and I thank you for asking me to come tonight. Well, thank you so much for coming, also given the weather and everything else. Um, yes. you're, you're welcome to do the same thing, is to present the thumbnail if you'd like, or we can just open up to questions, whatever your preference is. Well, I have a brief presentation I would like to do. I thought it would be appropriate since we haven't been here, and since I've been here as director. <coughs> We haven't been invited in, and I thought it would be nice to give you a little bit of an overview of where Lilly Library has come since the renovation that was done. Um, in September of 2006, Lilly Library reopened its doors as a totally transformed library. No longer was it to be the quiet little neighborhood library that it had been for so many years. With the implementation of the CWMR's network, which connects Lilly Library to the communities throughout the Commonwealth, 
the library became truly a library without walls. During 2006, our patrons first had to rediscover this library. And by 2007, word was spreading about all over that this was all that was now offered at the library. Library usage began to increase, and that usage mushroomed and continues to grow monthly. To give you a sense of that growth, I'm going to share just a few statistics. In 2007, the library saw 57,114 walk through their doors. In 2012, we saw 67,980 people walk through the doors and checked out 9,996 items per week to, it, to our patrons last year. FY 2013, though not completed, has been seeing a circu the circulation has just been soaring. The first two-thirds of the fiscal year have averaged 12,101 items checked out per week. Our, our monthly circulation has increased by 95.75 percent since 2007, and it's an increase of 33 percent over 2012 for that same period. And I was looking at July through February um, figures because of the transition in our network software, I wasn't able to capture numbers for those last few months of 2012 to factor in. By 2008, it was clear that staffing levels had to be increased to assure service to patrons and that both floors of the library needed to be staffed. Prior to this, we rarely had more than two staff members serving the public in the whole library at a time. The children's librarian would be there offering story times, and the director maintained the administrative duties, and we have a part-time custodian who comes in in the early morning hours. When a public computer was stolen from our second floor public service area, it was clear that staffing levels had to increase to serve our patrons and to protect our facility. Uh, so we did increase our staffing. Today we try to maintain a schedule that assures that at all times we have two people working our circulation desk. We have one person on the second floor work, serving reference doing the public computers, and then we'll have our children's librarian, who sometimes is not one of the two on the desk, but she's also doing story times, those kinds of things. And, um, and of course, I'm there in the office hand handling the administrative work. The building is maintained by our part-time part custodian, our children, almost really all of our staff with the exception of our assistant who helps in my office. She wears three hats, actually. She's, she's the as assistant to me in the office. She's also our young adult librarian, and she also handles the technology issues that we have. So she's wearing many hats, and she, she works full-time hours. Um, the building is maintained um, by our custodian. In addition to our shelver, we have a core of very dedicated volunteers who assist with shelving and with processing of daily delivery of the many bins of interlibrary loan materials that travel in and out of our library every day. During the school year, we also have work-study students who assist us that come up from Smith College. Uh, they help primarily on the evenings and weekends when our staffing is lowest. The grounds are maintained by a contracted service. The building equipment is also maintained by contracted services. The library goes out to bid for those services. We also have a very dedicated board of trustees who are frequently here assisting with building issues, technology issues, and other matters that may arise. This library is a much loved library. It's loved by our community. It's loved by the parents and children who come to our library. It's loved by its trustees and by the staff that work there. Its usage is a testimony to that. Services that are provided regularly at Lilly Library include weekly story times for children of all ages. They're run by our children's librarian. Attendance tops 2,500 annually who come to these programs. 
regular programs for tweens and teens run by our young adult librarian. This service has been established through a two-year Library Services and Technology Act federal grant, and the grant runs out in September of this year. Uh, we will be continue, continuing young adult services, but it will be at a smaller level in 2014. An annual summer reading program is offered. Uh, we have been closing the year with about 500 children and parents that come and participate in the programs, and about 100 kids usually complete the reading part of that program. Um, it's sponsored by a grant that we receive. We've been lucky enough to receive for many years through the Zurich Foundation and by the Friends of Lilly Library. Uh, we have a monthly mystery book club that's for adults that's run by our assistant director. And a, weir a winter series of adult programming that's provided by the Friends of Lilly. Generally, their programs run through January through April. We have up to 10 public access computers for library patrons to use. They're available in the reference and children's departments. And those computers were provided through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation grant and the Friends of Lilly Library. We have a community meeting room, which can be reserved for use by outside groups. It's a very popular space. And the groups that use that room range from the Florence Poetry Society to the mobile li library of LGBT books to Spanish classes for preschoolers. We have a quiet study room that provides space for tutoring throughout the day. And it also houses local history materials that are about Florence and Northampton and some of the adjacent communities. With intention, Lilly Library has developed a collection that offers high interest fiction and nonfiction, lifelong learning materials, and materials to promote general well-being. We try to, with intention, to balance what we offer in our collection against Forbes. We recognize that Forbes is the research library for the city as far as public libraries go, and we don't try to mimic that. Um, between the two libraries, much is offered to our community. As a smaller library with a clear vision of purpose, Lilly Library is able to offer much with a relatively small part-time staff. Our personnel hours total 7.14 equivalent full-time hours, which break down to 1.94 FTEs that are dedicated for administrative work, computer maintenance, shelving, and custodial work, and 5.2 FTE hours that are dedicated for maintaining our 41 weekly public service hours, along with programming for children, young adults, and adults, ordering and processing new materials, maintaining the collection, and program planning. Much is accomplished with very little. Annually, we see over 3,000 people walk through our doors. We are open six days a week, and this includes Saturdays and Sundays, a time when many libraries close. Lilly Library is what it is today because of the support that we receive from the city of Northampton, from our local community of users, from local businesses, from local and federal grants, from our board of trustees, from our volunteers, and from the Friends of Lilly Library. Without any of these pieces, we would not be able to do what we do. Ours is a very tight budget that struggles to keep up with ever-growing expenses. We are pleased with what we do, and we look forward to many years that are rich in service to our community. We thank you for the part that this council has played in making that possible. Thank you. I'll be um, happy questions. to answer any questions. Uh, uh, I thank you for coming. I, I'm pretty familiar with your operation. Uh, the uh, it's a beehive of activity all the time there. It is. Uh, it was amazing. I remember a lot of uh, during the debate on the expansion. Yes. The uh, why did it have to be so big? Why is it? I remember all that, but it turned out to be that funding was only available if you could show that what you had expanded was going to take you 50 years into the future. Yes. And I remember. A, all that uh, that debate, and uh, I think it, it's a great place. It's a great resource, um, and I thank you very much. It's, thank it's you. an excellent library. Thank you. We'd like to think so too. Yes. Uh, any other questions? 
Do you have a parking problem in there? Sometimes we do. Yes, um, because a couple of my residents go there faithfully, and they said sometimes they do have a problem. We, our lot is fairly small. Um, we also have some, there is street parking, and we, there's sort of a give and take between ourselves and the Civic Center in that their folks tend to, we'll park in our parking lot and some of our folks will park in theirs. Um, but uh, on a give, on some days it does get quite tight. Yes. Thank you for all your hard work and your staff. Thank you. One more. I, I get a lot of questions from the public about the library and the, pre, the people that I call and people that I know and it's usually uh, Charlotte or Kim. Yes. And um, they're always more than helpful and um, I thank them very much too. Thank you. They will be glad to hear that. I think all of our staff works very hard. Yes. Thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Director Dorsey. We appreciate you making the time for us and, and, and all that you do. Thank you. Thanks. Um, up next is uh, the Arts Council. This is uh, page 78 in the book. Uh, Bob Silman is here with about nine tenths of his board. I think it's <laughs> so. All right. Hello. Um, you want to give a thumbnail? You want to? You want to? Or you just? Well, I can. Um, Brian Foote sent you all um, the Northampton Arts Council report of 2013, and I can go over a little of it if you'd like. I mean, the, the big important points is what we do, which is um, we have two grant funding cycles. Uh, I think we're the only arts council in the state that uh, funds two rounds of grants for artists. And we do it with money that we raise through four Sundays in February and trans performance. We also do a, a, a biennial art exhibit at uh, Forbes Library at the Hosmer Gallery. We um, sponsor the Poet Laureate program. We do public art. Um, we're dealing with it right now because the bridge got hit again uh, a couple of days ago. Um, we do arts enrichment programming for the Northampton Public Schools. We bring in all sorts of things into the schools. We do Kids Best Fest, which is a children's international film festival. Youth film, which is films that are made by local kids. And um, we also support the B.J. Goodwin Fund, which is a fund that allows artists to do um, special projects. Um, we've funded artists to go to uh, Croatia, to Israel, local artists who have um, projects that they couldn't do without extra money from us. We also supported uh, a group of uh, musicians to go to South by Southwest this year, uh, to the South by Southwest Festival. So we do a lot, and I think, and um, it's a transitional year for us because I'm retiring as of September, and we're in the process of um, looking at that transition and seeing exactly how we want to um, establish the Arts Council for the years to come. And our budget is, you know, pretty, it's just a $32,000 budget, which, um, our $33,000 budget, and that covers basically 70% of the executive director's salary. And that's uh, the budget from the city. And um, but our full budget is around $140,000. So we raise the rest of that money uh, by things that we produce. It's, I think it's rather important to emphasize that the, the grants that you're awarding are money that you generate through programming, that there's been some misunderstanding by some members in the community thinking that you're doling out money out of the general fund to send people to Croatia at one point. In fact, no, actually, we, we don't do that. This is you do the, the, all the events that you describe that you produce actually generate the revenue and the grant money and the grant awards that wouldn't otherwise be available. Right. I think that's kind of important to emphasize. Uh, Councilor Tacey. In the yeah. Can you touch on the youth film program? Can you get a, a thumbnail of that? Yeah, it's a program that we do on the last Saturday of the four Sundays in February. We um, show films that are made by kids uh, throughout the region, actually. and. Uh, you know, they get to see these films that they make. It's amazing how many films we get, and, and they get to see them on the Academy of Music screen, which is a real thrill, I think, for any young filmmaker. So it's been a really successful program. We've been working a lot closer with NCTV on it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's a really fascinating 
yeah. look at what kids are thinking. Is there any, because my son had a, a course at the high school, it was audio visual, and they made flicks and stuff, and uh, it was amazing. Yeah. What they actually thought of, you talk about creative thinking. I mean, it was, uh, I, think, I, I think it's a heck of a program, and I just wanted you to touch on it, because uh, yeah. for me, I think it's one of the best uh, things on your list. Well, thank you. So, uh, and thank you very much for I hope it, I hope it continues. That's, yes. that's what we're really looking forward to. I liken it to the way they do math. They teach math now. They don't tell you just to line your numbers up anymore. They say get creative and think about just exactly how you put them together in your head. And uh, kind of anything what we're that, doing with the budget. Anything that, put, that promotes creative thinking is great. <laughs> uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels. Thank you. Uh, is that how we're doing this? <laughs> it feels like it sometimes, yes. Director Silman, uh, this is a, I realize this is very, this is not very easy to put down in, in the budget book because um, a lot of these expenses are paid for out of fundraising. So they're paid for out of right. funds that, that you collect through your, through your, um, through your programming. Right. Um, so, you know, scrutiny over how much you're paying in rent or whatever, that, that, that goes, that happens when you decide what, what venues to use or how to, how to, what, what to charge or, or what have you. So, um, I, I guess my question is more general, which is that I, I just would like to get a sense for um, how much of this, how much of this is in the programming. I mean, it looks like most of it, almost but I can't really tell. Really, you mean the expenses? Yeah, it's almost all programming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's what and the it arts costs to, to do our programming, and the arts council and. The expenses of giving grants to artists, right? right. That, that's the artist grant, for example, or the uh, or the poet laureate. The artist fees, that's programming. Um, union labor, that's programming. Hospitality, film costs, musician fees, piano tuning. Now, the poet laureate is—I don't know if you'd call that programming. It's just a, a, a program that we sponsor. Um, uh, but yeah, almost all of that is. And it's the arts council that oversees the expenditure of these things related to related to I cannot hear you I'm sorry, I'm sorry it's the it's the Arts Council that oversees these this program the, the expense expenditures related to the yes performances you put on or the or the events or so on and so forth right okay um, so I guess one of my questions is you're you, you only have really two people working uh, and not even full time, right. in uh, in promoting the arts in the city, right. is that? Do you feel as though? Uh, I mean, do you feel as though that is at risk with your retirement? I do. I mean, I think I think what's strange about my situation is that I've always done the arts council and the young at heart, and young at heart has put thirty percent of uh, my salary into the city budget, and that's going to disappear. So. What we're going to have basically is a 24-hour position and a 20-hour position, and I think that it's going to be really tricky for the people who have to take this on to do all this programming with with that level of support. But we'll have to see how that goes. So, you, so just to recap, you are worried for the you are worried for the future of the kind of services you pro the kinds of in the arts we always worry about the future i mean it, it's it's always done on a complete thumbnail and uh and we, <coughs> with more money we could do more things and it would be more beneficial for the city but we also understand the limitations of what the city has to fund um so yeah i mean if you're asking me if i'm concerned about it absolutely and you would, I mean, I know the Arts Council's here. I mean, are they, as, as the Arts Council as well, concerned about their ability to, to staff these kinds of uh, programmings that, you, that has, been, yes. has been performed in the past? So then my, I guess I have one more question, which is, uh, well, actually, just really a comment. Um, I, I want to thank you for the work that, uh, that you've done uh, th throughout your career and, um, 
and the kinds of things that, that have been put on by the Arts Council are, uh, are really tremendous. They're a tremendous attraction to the city. They're a tremendous val resource. And um, it's truly, I think, money very well spent. Uh, it's what part of, it, par part of what feeds Northampton's reputation as an arts town. And it only costs us $40,000 a year. Uh, and it, it brings in it brings in tourism. It enriches our own lives, and uh, I think it's, it's tremendous money, and it's well spent. Thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Councilor Tacey, I just want to echo pretty much what uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels said. The the economic vitality that, that, that brings to the city, the Arts Council, I think, is um, immeasurable. So, and thank you very much for all for your service. Thank you, Council Labarge. Yes, um, thank you, and thank your department, small department, for many, many years. For the four Sundays in February, um, for a long time, I participated in doing the advertising for that program. It's fantastic, and you as a director, I could see, even if you're leaving, of having concerns that 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 department really produces like you always have another thing i'm concerned about is the young at heart because you were saying something about their the pay is like what 30 percent i think you said 30 percent of a full-time salary went uh was paid for by young at heart which will not continue when i leave. of your salary yeah <clears throat> Thank you for everything. Councilor Adams. Well, you're welcome. You know, as long as you're thanking me, I, I just want to mention that we're doing um, a tribute <laughs> a to Dwayne Robinson, who, uh, you know, we really couldn't have done all the stuff we did at the Arts Council without the f work that Dwayne has done over the years at the Academy of Music. I mean, the fact that we were able to do so many events there, it's been, for us, it's been the building that's kind of been our mainstay and focus. and. Uh, as you know, Dwayne is um, retiring, and, it's, and we're doing a tribute to him. We're showing the Phantom of the Opera, the Lon Chaney version, 1925, and um, with the Alloy Orchestra, which is a wonderful um, live orchestra that, that does music for uh, silent films. And it'll be a wonderful tribute to Dwayne, and it's happening June 23rd at the Academy of Music. So, Councilor Adams has a question. I just want to say... I've been a member of the Arts Council, and I want to thank you for all you've done and thank the whole Arts Council. Um, I am concerned about if, if when you leave, there's, there's a transition period, and within that transition period, um, the department is unable to do all the things that they've done in the past. I would hope that the council reaches out to the, to the Arts Council reaches out to the City Council immediately so we can, we can try to help that, particularly the Culture and Recreation Committee, which I serve along with Councilor Freeman Daniels and Councilor Carney because... Um, I'm concerned about the arts in this community, and if we lose anything within that transition, I hope that you come to us immediately. I, I do too. See if and there's anything that we can. You do. have you have members of our board here, and I think that um, it is going to be a tricky thing. I think it's really critical that we keep, you know, first night, four Sundays, and trans performance. I mean, they're huge events for this community, and they 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 really define this community in a certain way. And I think that it's critical that we um, figure out a way to continue all of that I agree. and create more you know because there's a lot of I mean the great thing about my leaving is that there's a lot of young energy out there that uh, is going to think about things in a different way and in an interesting way and I'm I'm really excited about the future of the Arts Council what time is the Phantom what time is oh the Phantom is at uh, 7 o'clock there's a 530 reception and if you want to buy tickets you can buy them from me how's that Thank you. Any other questions? Bob, uh, Bob's swan song comes at Trans Performance. It's the, uh, the theme being? It's going to be beyond Bob because beyond. Trans Performance has to continue as far right. as I'm concerned. But it's all, it's all Bob bands like <laughs> Bob Dylan and Bob Marley and, uh, and the Bobs. And so, the Bobs, of course, <laughs> so, I was going to say. Um, and, and 
Uh, have um, you decided to be Bob Hope yet, or is uh, I, I well, I think there's a fight over who's going to be Bob Hope. I'm, I don't know. I might be the Bobsy Twins or something. And they, <laughs> the uh, but to add on to the the praise that we're kind of dumping on you here, the fact is is that the Arts Council, as it in in its current manifestation, is only exists because of the work and energy that you put in and the creativity, and that you actually evolved a department that, uh, you know, lottery funds, of course, funded programs like this all over the state. Mm -hmm. Then, the, once again, the state decided that they weren't going to devote that money to arts anymore. They were going right. to put it, the, <laughs> they're going to put it anywhere they could. Right. And consequently, uh, arts councils dropped like dead flies on a windowsill. And ours actually thrived. Ours expanded and grew and created uh, a signature programming that, that, as you said, is part of the identity of this community. And Council Freeman Daniels referred to that too. This is how transperformance uh, was was covered uh, across the country, and mm -hmm. people travel from great distances to see these programs. And they're not just quaint little local locally produced. Uh, Programs. These are these are standalone artistic presentations that are that are that involve the community, with a certain uh, Bob Silman flair, which includes dancing in the aisles and uh, a looseness that's actually that I think really kind of reflects our perspective of ourselves. And uh, and to that, the spirit I hope does go beyond Bob, yeah. but I I certainly am very appreciative of the fact that the spirit was established and placed by Bob. So I don't know. I, I, so yeah, once again, thanks. Thank you. Um, Council LaBarge. Yes, one more. Um, I also want to thank you with the Young at Hearts for the literacy project on that fundraiser. Mm. Awesome. They did such a wonderful job. Oh, thank, thank you. you. That, that yes, kind of haunts you. my dreams with all these people turning at me and going. I don't. <laughs> 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 I did. That was a wonderful event, and thank you for. Well, your thank you. And I, I, the only thing I, I would say is, you know, the arts council has always liked to keep it simple, and they've always wanted to just raise money to give money to artists. I mean, there's something very useful about giving money to artists and getting out of the way. And that's really kind of our motto. So I hope that continues. I think it'll be really useful for this town. An elegant and good self-perpetuating system. So we appreciate that. Say? An elegant and good self-perpetuating system that we really appreciate. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, uh, Arts Council Board. I can't believe that you would sit in these hard chairs for this length of time, but clearly devoted to, uh, to, the, to the Arts Council. So thank you. Noted. Thank you. That actually ends our hearings. There is an opportunity. I, we do have now. There was a request from Legal Services to be part, part of this, and we asked in order to save money that Legal Services submit a, me, uh, a memo, and you have a copy of that. And I would accept the motion to put that into the public so record. Put it second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Discussion. Yeah. Uh, sure. The only problem with the memos, there's not a number on it, so I was kind of curious because all the other departments submitted numbers numbers are totally okay we can we can we can probably like you know if you want an itemized bill from your lawyer you have to say right. <laughs> well the lawyer might know something about that but that's, it'll take him a while to figure it out it comes to angel number hours um is there any other discussion on any other oh yeah lots of stuff right? uh june 20th of course yes on june 20th june 20th we have a meeting a monstrous meeting ahead of us, and uh, included in. They become more monstrous as they go along. Well, there are lots of opportunities to pile things onto it, but uh, um, what were we saying, Mary? We were saying that, well, first of all, we, we are talking about convening earlier in order to address this and still show up at 7 o'clock with a public session. We also have scheduled hearings. I don't know if you recall, but we have a mm -hmm. poll hearing and uh, some fuel storage hearings at the uh, DPW. The, those are scheduled at, sevens, at the 7.05, 7 and so on. The public session will come at 7, but if we go in front of the meeting and take the perfunctory Some uh, things off. The, uh, uh, vote out the minutes and vote on the committee reports and mm -hmm. also referrals and everything else and clear that up. Then we can 
address the budget, which will be presented by the mayor, and that's what we will be voting on first reading. And also, there are some zoning changes, of course, that are pretty significant as well. But and two resolutions that three. we postponed already from the last right. meeting. The sidewalk one. And three resolutions, right? Three resolutions. Oh, we can't do all that. So, well, the idea was is if we were able to convene, say, an hour earlier, that I think hopefully we can get that done. No, does that, do you mean that we would start public comment at six? No, we started at seven. Well, we should probably start public comment at the beginning of the meeting. I mean, what, what's well, the reason? The reason I I thought about that, but it, the problem is advertising public comment, and this is particularly in in, in looming in the budget coming. I, I I think there'll be a lot of people who will not know that the time has changed and not show up and be very upset okay. if they showed up at seven and we finished. Point of order. Yes. Can we close the discussion on the budget before we get to new business? I think that's appropriate. Uh, all those in favor of closing the aye. budget? Aye. aye. Actually, I didn't hear a second on that. I'm sorry. Second, second aye. Okay, okay. Second and aye. All right. So, Christine, do you have any thoughts on this? On this I would just suggest that this is a discussion to be had under new business. Yes. We'll call that new business. So, right. do you have? But do you have any other comments on the on the proposal? Well, I concur with Councillor Adams. Uh, if we're going to start earlier, we probably want to start the meeting with public comment. Um, and what about my concern, which is that, that there will be a number of members of the public who will be caught up short and not know that they will not be able to speak at 7 o'clock. Well, I interrupted you before you had a chance to say your concern, so now yeah, that, that you said it, now that, now that you said it, maybe I feel a little... Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Especially prior to the override vote. Exactly. I think, I mean, I think it's kind of important that, I mean, that's actually a very critical feature. It's not something we do as, as a sort of gimme. It's, this is actually where we hear from the public. And I, I would understand why some public, some of the public might be caught off guard and caught by surprise if we inform them. But yeah, I'm sorry. We did public comment an hour ago. You, I mean, we, we could give, give people the opportunity at five as well. I mean, if they, if more public comment. In the beginning, at, at, at five. I'm sorry, we're starting six o'clock. Six. <laughs> yes. No, because the email first email said six. We, so we're going to so it's going to be we're going to do six. We're going to yeah, six o'clock. I think was the consensus. Uh, um, and well, I'm sure people will show up. It's the people who might not have gotten the word, even though it's publicly advertised. I mean, we would meet the letter of the law. I'm actually interested in abiding by the spirit of the law, which is to not exclude somebody just simply because we met all the conditions of advertising and everything else. I just I think it's too critical at this point. This is the budget. This is the. Uh, and people have this in their head for seven. Yeah. Uh, Council. Yeah, I think I concur with. Let's meet at six. Get a lot of our functioning business out of the way, and then do our public comment and go into the remainder of our meeting. And I'd actually really like to see how much we like six because I would love to meet just you know in the new session a discussion for later just start at six o'clock because uh, I think it's easier on everybody and I know you know doing important things at 10 o'clock at night the public isn't watching necessarily we're starting Hi, to fade and uh, think about that Council Barge, Council um, when I received that email um, through you, Bill and Mary, I think it's a very good idea if we could possibly start at six o'clock, and also go into our council agenda and pull out whatever, like our minutes and whatever has to be done. Then at seven o'clock, go into our open public session. So, so if we I finish, like that. if we finish the perfunctory early break until seven. Sure. Right. I don't think it'd be a fight about that. I have. I have. I'm um, fine with starting at six, but that means I'll beginning to I'll begin to vote no on everything at ten. <laughs> that's that's just, right. So that's, that was my that was my my comment. No. Starting voting at ten. Uh, uh, so yeah, that, that was my my comment <laughs> was to uh, <laughs> the end date the the end game to ten well, rather than eleven. Was, the idea was to make enough room. Yeah, because we're still going for, for the big issues. So um, just doing it in the same amount of time. The idea is to give us more time if we needed it. We might not need it. I mean, let's be honest, the past budget debates when we voted on the budgets, pretty much we've had lots of discussions about it. We pretty much know where we feel on all these issues. So it's probably not going to be a long uh, yeah. uh, 
it could be, but I mean, I think in the past so far we've seen that it hasn't necessarily yeah. been. And uh, but then the, there's some rather relevant and pertinent zoning issues that are coming up too that have uh, the public's weighed in on as well. Councilor Freeman Daniels, can I recommend this? Is I mean, the, the reason why we have public comment is so that the public can comment on things we're voting on, right? So usually you can pretty much guess that the public's not going to want to vote on a uh, comment on you know mm -hmm. approval of minutes or something like that or even referrals but may i suggest just leave trying it. trying to d get that kind of work before public comment yes that was the that's what we referrals and right. that was the point what was the word perfunctory, perfunctory. i think it's difficult it's difficult is a difficult judgment i mean you know regarding even hearings and or or rather uh, you know sec second hand you know, secondhand sales, for example. I mean, you know, right. we, we haven't normally had public comment relating to that, but we may. There's, there's no, none of those pending on the agenda yet, right? For example, you could take your finance committee and do all of those items, and there would still be opportunity for the public to comment on those items because we've talked about them in regular meetings. Right, we'll be referring this out of finance. So, the so, the, so, but that, so that, that's, a different, that's a different chair. Right, the chair, the chair can, that chair can set the finance committee but, meeting at six. You know, certainly we talk about in finance, we kick it to the regular meeting, so we can do the financial orders later, and do the finance committee earlier. Yeah, I mean the objective is to provide the best open governance at the same time doing it in a time that we're still compass mentis. I think is the plan. It was even a little open. Oh, it was in <laughs> council it was like of an open conversation. No, council of Barge. Also, I would like to, um, I have concerns here where I've noticed a couple of counselors, when we go to suspend rules, you do not say what that rule is. And I've had people question me on that. And I think you as counselors should say on a late file what that rule is, no matter what we are doing with the rules. And I think some of the people that had concerns about it, I agree with them. Noted. And That's I'm hoping, good. please, that we can get back to that like we always did and state the rule that you're suspending. Okay. Councilor Tacey? Well, that was it. That was it. Anything else? Yeah. I'll accept a motion to adjourn. Move. Second. Third. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all.